Genesis 6. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward. When the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them, they were the powerful men of old, the famous men. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was wide spread on the earth and that every incl inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved then the Lord said I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth together with the animals creatures that crawl and birds of the sky for I regret that I made them Noah however found favor with the Lord these are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. This is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You are to make a roof, finishing the sides of the ark to within 18 inches of the roof. You are to put a door in the side of the ark. Make it with lower, middle, and upper decks. Understand that I am bringing a flood, flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of everything, from the birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their kinds, will come to you so that you can keep them alive. Take with you every kind of food that is eaten. Gather it as food for you and for them. And Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded him. This is the word of the Lord. Do you so promise to honor, to love, and to cherish her, for richer or poor, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, until death do you part? Everyone knows that one. That's a marriage promise. But promises aren't always so warm and fuzzy. In your household, you may have heard something along the lines, especially growing up, if I brought you into this world, I promise I can take you out of it. But depending on the person making that promise, you may snap to attention, you may trust the certainty of the outcome, or you just may write off the promises, just more empty words. But what will you do when the person making the promise is God himself? How will you respond when his promises are of destruction and deliverance? Like Joel said, my name is Ben. I'm a member here at New Eden, uh, and I'm happy to be preaching today, but the happy part comes at the end. Uh, let's pray one more time. Father, would the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer? Uh, would you help us to hear your promises? Would you help us to believe them? In Jesus' name, amen. There's no real getting around the passage that Aaron read for us. It's hard. It's hard to understand. It's hard to receive, and it's really hard to turn our hearts to Jesus. So let's take a running start at it. Previously in Genesis, and this will be familiar for anyone that's been here, we see the Lord speaking creation into existence. He forms Adam out of dust. He gives him the breath of life. From Adam, the Lord forms Eve. Adam and Eve walk with God. The Lord commands them to fill the earth and multiply. A serpent comes along. A forbidden fruit is eaten, and the couple are cast out of the garden, clothed, but with the stain of sin. They build their family only to have Cain murder his brother Abel, and Cain is cursed and sent eastward to wander, spreading wickedness as he goes. And God gives Eve another son, Seth, and people begin to call on the name of the Lord. This is a good thing. But generations pass, each living long lives and each perishing. And then we get to the arrival of Noah and the start of our passage today. And remember, we read Genesis as a theological historical narrative, which are big words which mean that we believe that these events happened, but that they happened in part to inform us of who God is. So with that in mind, I believe God is promising us two main things in today's passage. The first is that the Lord will destroy the wicked in his grief. The Lord will destroy the wicked in his grief. And the second promise is that the Lord will deliver the righteous in his grace. The Lord will deliver the righteous in his grace. So those are our two promises today. First, 
Let me take a drink of water. The Lord will destroy the wicked in his grief. Our passage starts today with a worldwide view, so we've momentarily zoomed out from the line of Seth on this singular line, and we see a wider view of mankind's filling of the earth. And the Lord's command to fill the earth is being done, but rather than the earth being filled with people who worship him and call on his name, it's being filled with wickedness. And that wickedness is being accelerated by these sons of God, very mysterious, who take as many daughters of man as they want to be their wives, and then these unholy marriages produce the giant Nephilim. And it seems that no one really knows for sure what these, who these sons of God are. One view, um, there are kind of three main views. The one view is that they are fallen angels who uh, left heaven to feed, for, to feed their lust for women. Second view is that the sons of God were human rulers. They used their power to forcefully take the women for their wives. Or three, that they were men from the righteous line of Cain and who married women from the unrighteous line. Sorry, Men from the righteous line of Seth married people from the unrighteous line of Cain. And you could probably convince me of any of those arguments, but I tend to lean towards believing that these sons of God are the rebellious fallen angels. The fallen angel view was the only view held by the church until the second century, and in the New Testament, Peter and Jude seem to have no trouble connecting the judgment of Noah's day with the judgment of the fallen angels. Uh, if you want to research that more, there's 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 2, and Jude. But we must move on. Whoever you believe the sons of God to be, the point remains, these unholy marriages fanned the flames of wickedness. The earth was filled with corrupted flesh whose entire morality had been turned to ashes. But their wickedness does not go unnoticed. Let's look at verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. For one, this shows that it is only the Spirit of God that gives us life. And for another, you see the Lord, the giver of life, putting a shot clock on the existence of man. The phrase, my spirit will not remain, is worth a closer look because other translations, like the KJV, they translate it as, my spirit shall not always strive after man. The Spirit is not only sustaining man's life, but he is striving after man, putting up with man, pleading with man, return to God. And the Spirit will continue to strive and plead with man for a long time. He is patient. He is not wanting anyone to perish. But the striving will come to an end. His striving ends because the wicked, both in Noah's day and in ours, they resist him. They quench him and they outrage him. And after so much striving, the Spirit will not remain with man. So church, let's not be a people that hardens our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Would we pray for ourselves and each other which we pray for soft hearts that do not turn a cold shoulder to the Spirit's striving. And the removal of the Spirit is just a sample of the Lord's destruction of the wicked. In the next scene, the Lord sees how wide the stain of wickedness spreads and how deep the stain <coughs> soaks. Let's look at verse 5. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, <laughs> The Lord regretted that he had made man. The wickedness was everywhere, and it was in everyone, and it was all the time. To quote the psalm, there is no one who does good, no, not one. The stain of sin had spread across the global home of man, and it so deep into the minds and hearts of all mankind. There's passages like these that inform our doctrine of the sinfulness of man. You may have heard it called total depravity. But whether sinfulness or depravity, what Genesis makes clear is that after the fall, the default will of man is not goodness, but wickedness. And we see this widespread wickedness in the passage here, and we also see it today. I'm sure you're aware of the major wars happening now, and you've probably heard individual stories of a complete disregard for human life in those wars. You've heard about corrupt governments oppressing their own people and systematically murdering other peoples. But what about closer to home? Consider your neighbor's drunken tirades. Consider your boss berating another employee. Consider wounds that you carry that were caused by your family members. It's easy to see wickedness that's out there. But what about wickedness in yourself? And you may say, me, what about me? I'm not violent. I'm not wicked. I haven't murdered my brother. I haven't shot anyone. Definitely haven't committed genocide. The wickedness, I agree, the wickedness is all over the earth. It is all out there, but it's not in this seat. But what about what about fits of rage towards your children or spouse? What about insults, masters' jokes, 
Gossip masked as concern. What about deliberately ignoring a stranger in need? What about the careless, aggressive use of your words, typed or spoken? What about any grudges that you're holding on to? For the record, these are all questions I've had to answer to over the past few weeks. If you're realizing that there does remain wickedness in your heart, then take a moment and lament with Paul from Romans 7. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? We'll answer that later. Because wickedness was everywhere in Noah's day, we can see that now, and it's continued into our day. It's, in fact, in our own hearts. So what will the Lord do with this wickedness? Verse 5 again. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and that he was deeply grieved. Regret and grief. There's much in Scripture on the anger of God, but here we get regret and grief. The word regret is problematic to our modern ears, and I want to try to offer some different language that helps, I think, get to the root of the meaning. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I've studied uh, from different people who are Hebrew scholars uh, who kind of line up with this. So regret implies that God made a mistake or that he needed to change his mind somewhere along the way but we cannot agree with this because we believe in the perfection of God. Deuteronomy 32.4, his work is perfect. We also believe in the immutability or the unchangeability of God. Numbers 23.19, God is not a man that he might change his mind. And because God is perfect and unchanging, we can trust him and his word, and we are not left guessing what his next move is. But this idea of unchangeability is more complex than perfection. But what we must know is that God planned his work of redemption in eternity past, and that plan remains the same until it is complete. And that same plan that we know now is a part of the same plan from Genesis 6, even if it results in destruction. But I haven't really answered the question yet of what regret means. Uh, some of us talk about it. you can't define something by what it's not. So let's take a stab at some Hebrew. I'll need your help here. The word that is translated regret is, repeat after me, nakim. Nakim. It's used multiple times in Genesis and in the Old Testament. It's translated all sorts of different ways. You have regret, relent, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Maybe it's some others. But here's some examples. In Genesis 24, Isaac, after his mom's death, is nakimed or comforted by his wife, Rebekah. In Exodus 32, after Israel builds a golden cow and calls it God, the Lord promises wrath, but then we read that the Lord nakims and, calls, er, and, nakims and relents from his wrath. It appears as though the idea behind nakim is what one commentator calls a balancing of the ledger, an auditing of the accounts. If we're putting this understanding of nakim back into the text, verse 6 may actually read closer to the following. The Lord audited his creation of man and he was deeply grieved. So with this in mind, Isaac's ledger of mourning is balanced by his wife's comfort. With the golden cow incident, the ledger of wrath is balanced by Israel's repentance. And here in Genesis 6, the ledger is deep into the red, but there's no repentance to balance the ledger. So God, being just in his perfection and his unchangeability, must take stock of his creation, he must audit, and he must balance the ledger. But when there is no repentance, then death is the only way to balance the ledger. For the wages, the earnings of sin, is death. The Lord must, and he has promised, to destroy the wicked. But with this understanding of auditing, you may have a picture of a God who is cold, he's just a gray accountant. Which is why it's important that we read that God grieves over our sin. God promises a destruction that is just, it is deserved, it is exact, it is precise, but it is not heartless. God grieves. We as a people, I think, are well acquainted with grief. We know what it means to grieve. I don't think I need to go into Hebrew here. We've had tears stream down our face. We've struggled to get out of bed after last night's news. We've walked as if we had concrete blocks attached to our feet. We know grief. But do we understand that God grieves over our sin? We must be careful here to understand that our sin does not compromise God in any way. No matter our sin, God is still God. But yet Genesis tells us that God grieves over our sins. It hurts, it pains, it displeases God. 
So church, some applications, are we as a people willing to audit our souls? Are we willing to submit what God calls sin and repent of it? Are we willing to remove the log in our eye, and are we willing to pull the speck out of our brother's eye? Are we a church that grieves over our sin? As we consider how the Spirit strives after us and how widespread wickedness is in our hearts, are we grieved by what we find? Are we grieved enough to confess our sin to each other and repent? I'll offer an answer here. I think that generally we do have a a church culture open to confessing and repenting of sin. This is part of what we do earlier in our gatherings at Sam Red, and the log and speck removals happen in our growth partnerships. It's certainly not... It's certainly not fun when it's your moment under the knife, but it is for our good. I'm thankful for the way that New Eden welcomes and encourages confession, repentance, and forgiveness of sin. So if I could then urge us all to do so more and more. If you're not grieved over your sin, then we should, look at, uh, we should take a look at God's promises that his nakim, his audit, and his grief lead to. Let's look at verse 7. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. So make no mistake, this wiping of mankind is not some slap on the wrist or just kind of dusting off. What we are reading is that God will blot out sin. God is wetting a rag and putting all of his weight into removing the stain of sin from mankind. And in fact, that includes the destruction of man. By flooding the earth, the the Lord promises that the world will return back to a watery state without form, without void, and without mankind. It's a promise of destruction and of uncreation. We're going backwards, back towards Genesis 1, 2. But here's the tricky part. He promises another judgment day, but that day will be filled with fire, not water. 2 Peter 3, 5-7. For scoffers deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed, that's the world we're reading about here, was flooded with water and it perished. But by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist, that's where we're standing now, are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Do we understand that God sees wickedness and will not stand by idly? Do we understand that he is so grieved by wickedness that he must destroy all of the wicked? Do we understand the need to repent of our sin and prepare for the coming day of judgment? And I hope and I think that the answer is yes, we do understand that for ourselves. But forget about ourselves for a moment. Do we understand that there are people across the world down the street, in our homes, in our group texts, that are currently on the path towards destruction? Are we grieved by their sin and their unbelief? Are we willing to pray for them? Are we willing to sacrifice our comfort zone to show them the way of life because we know that the Lord will destroy the wicked in his grief? After promises of destruction, we do get promises of grace. We get to the good stuff. Verse 8. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. As God takes stock of the widespread wickedness and sees Noah and shows him favor, it's not like God liked what he saw in Noah. Noah deserved destruction like the rest of mankind, but God gives Noah grace, which is the second promise of today. The Lord will deliver the righteous in his grace. (laughs) Noah had a wife. He had three married sons. Noah was righteous and blameless, and importantly, he walked with God. You've heard this language before. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. Enoch walked with God and did not taste death. Those who God shows grace to walk with him and they live. Verse 13, the Lord tells Noah that the corruption of man has come before his eyes and that the only thing that can result is destruction. So God promises to bring the flood over the earth and then he gives Noah the plans for the means of his salvation. He gives him the plans for the ark. These instructions are incredibly brief, but note the kindness of God even in boat building. The ark has the capacity, it has the comfort, and it has the capability to accomplish the salvation of Noah, his family, and the animals. You were given the proportions of 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall, and if you are driving across the river today, if you want a comparison, you're looking at roughly the footprint of four barges, 
in the volume of eight. It's a big boat. But it was the necessary capacity to house man and animals alike. And all things considered, they were fairly comfortable. There was enough food, there was enough light, there was enough fresh air, and there were rooms to keep order among the species. Noah and his wife weren't sharing a stall with a pair of elephants or a pair of mice. And it was capable. This is my favorite piece of trivia I found while studying for the sermon. It's everyone's favorite, the Korea Research Institute of Ships and Engineering. Yeah, love those guys. They analyzed 12 early history boat designs and compared it to the proportions listed here. Obviously, they had to scale up the other ancient designs because nothing came close to this size. And out of the 13 designs, we should not be surprised, but that God's Ark was the most seaworthy. In high winds and in waves of greater than 90 feet, the Ark would have survived just fine. Matthew Henry, he's a minister who lived well before the Korean Institute of Ships and Engineering. He says that the ark couldn't be anything but well fitted for its purpose because infinite wisdom himself was the architect. Church, you can rest easy because if God provides your means of salvation, and he does, you can trust that the means are good for the task of accomplishing it. Verse 18, the Lord continues his instructions to Noah with a promise of a promise. Noah receives the promise of a covenant with the Lord. I won't get into it too much here, but this is a key phrase you're going to see in each generational account in Genesis. The Lord is choosing his people. He's covenanting with his people. And he will do it over and over again, even when wickedness rears its head among them. The Lord is gracious to keep his covenant promises to his people. And you will see that throughout the year. One more promise, Noah will not go hungry, and he will not go alone. Noah's wife and his family get to join. Noah's righteousness was counted not only towards himself, but also his family. The grace of God is extending through one man and flowing to many. I think you can see where I'm going. But if I could take a quick side moment, parents and spouses, be encouraged because you may have wayward children and other spouses that are given some extra measure of mercy by God because he sees your faithfulness. Their final salvation is still, of course, between them and the Lord, but your wayward family do not go unnoticed by him. Lastly, in verse 22, Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded him. We don't hear complaining. We aren't given a but. We are shown faithful obedience to the Lord's instructions. Noah's obedience and righteousness is a good thing. We should want to be like Noah in that regard. We should want to obey the Lord. We should want to be righteous. We should want to walk with him. But if that is our only takeaway, I do think that we're missing something. It is righteous Noah that is saved. But by zooming out, you see that the Lord is promising his people that salvation of the human race comes from a righteous one. And I'm talking about no one else but our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. He is the real son of God. He is no fallen angel. His life did not grieve God. He alone walked with God. There was no wickedness in him. In his mind was nothing but good all the time. But we are not saved only because he was perfect. We are saved because despite his perfection, he died and went under the flood of God's wrath and bore the sins of all mankind. Why would he do this? I was told not to get clever uh, with preaching, so here's John 3.16. <laughs> Seemed like a good one to turn back to. For God so loved the world, even the one that grieved him, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God not only gave up his son, but he raised him up from the depths of death. He audited the sins of mankind, and he considered the ledger balanced. Now Jesus lives at his right hand, striving for his promising eternal life to those who believe in him. Praise God. Hallelujah. At the beginning, I asked how you would respond to God's promises. If you're not a follower of Jesus, when you consider God's promises of destruction and deliverance, will you come out of your wandering in the land of the wicked? Will you repent of your sin? Will you believe in Jesus? Will you walk with him and live? And if so, any Christian here would love to talk more about walking with Jesus. And we're about to take the Lord's Supper. I'll be on the back wall if you don't know who to talk to. But if you are a follower of Jesus, when you consider God's promises of destruction and deliverance, will you consider people in your circle who currently face destruction? Will you pray for them? Will you have compassion on them? 
Will you be willing to tell them the way to life? And lastly, will you take heart? As Christians, will you be encouraged? Because as God promised that the ark was sufficient for Noah's salvation, so too did he promise that belief in Jesus was sufficient for yours.